Asia, and I am an engineer on the payments team at your PNP. <coughs> and you know, reading back on the description for this talk, um, I thought, wow, people must be thinking about what kind of talk is this going to be, and what on earth is there to talk about that's specific to payments on our program and conference. And also, if you read the, the description, probably some of you might wonder about whether I'm going to complain about some aspect or another of, of Rails, kind of the kind of complaints you often hear from people that have not yet achieved the state of nirvana of a true <laughs> Rails master. So I definitely have not achieved that. Um, and I will um, complain a little bit, I think. Um, but, um, but I hope that uh, you'll agree with me by the time I'm done that some of those trade offs that Present um, on, on worth making for any building payments. So I'm going to tell you about my experience building, or more accurately participating in the building um, of a few different payment systems for several large companies. Most recently at Airbnb, I've tried to take some of those um, some of the experiences and turn them into best practices, and try to share a few of those uh, with you. And. Um, and yeah, even though I might, um, you know, complain a little bit, uh, I think I started my journey uh, not really thinking that Rails was the right tool. And I have to admit that, you know, I now am confident that um, this is the right thing and that using Rails for payments is doable with some of the caveats that I'm going to uh, talk about. So I want to start over a decade ago when I joined uh, what is now a large and successful payments company, which was then a startup that is just been acquired by one of Silicon Valley's uh, successful companies. That startup was in the middle of a growth spurt, and it was hiring lots of engineers to help it sustain its growth and create the foundation for the future. And pretty quickly after joining, it became clear to me that there's tons and tons of work, not just because there's lots of features to be implemented, but because you know, folks there um, just did not have the time, they didn't have the inclination to focus on long-term thinking. It's not that they were smart or, or you know, had um, the wrong motivations, they were just focusing on survival and growth. And um, what it felt like to me was, you know, coming home to find that, you know, your roommates have been partying all night and they've left the house in complete disorder. They emptied the fridge, they left a mess in the kitchen, and tons of dirty And if you Google around, by the way, you might find a few relevant examples from the Airbnb's past, but I think that's a topic for another day. Um, and now, you know, the kitchen needs to churn out a lot of gourmet meals right, for a very long time. So it's a little bit of a problem. And that, that really brings me to the next point, which is any company. Any tech company, no matter which phase it is in, can and should think about code quality. It should think about readability, testability, maintainability, and those are all things I'm going to touch on later on in my talk. And I think it's especially true for companies or organizations within companies that are um, doing payments. Because people have kind of this unique, special relationship with their hard earned cash. You know, they might, people might tolerate if. You know, search results are a little out of date, or if some um, social media <coughs> site is not 100% caught up, usually people just don't notice. Um, but, you know, people notice really quickly and get really upset if something happens with their, uh, with their money or it's mishandled. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit, in many cases, it is possible to iterate on, um, on a product and gradually weed out all the problems. Um, by you know, kind of gradually exposing users to them. And um, you know, it's something that, that we often do. But with payments, it's a little bit more difficult. And that space is exactly where the anchors, you know, meet the hipsters, where the payments requirements collide with you know, the Ruby and Rails way. So let's start by talking about audit trails. Audit trails is, you know, <coughs> One of the most basic things any organization that's uh, dealing with payments needs to worry about. 
And you know it's a very easy concept. For every change in, let's say, exist balance, you have to keep track of who made that change, why they made it, and on behalf of who. It could be the user uh, interacting with the site, it could be a bank uh, returning uh, or completing a transaction that the user requested, it could be a customer service agent uh, on the phone with the user. Those are all legitimate reasons why the user's balance will change, but they all need to be wrong. Um, so, you know, it sounds some, some simple, right? I mean, you attach a few active record callbacks and you know, you're done, right? I think, you know, not exactly right. So, I mean, in theory, yes, it will work. But think about it. We have to be able to, um, to assure, to guarantee enough that, that you can stand in front of a judge in, in, in the court, or you can stand in front of an auditor that's trying to you know, look at your books of the company. You have to guarantee that 100% of those changes are audited and that there is no other change that somehow got away. So you know, maybe the idea of um, active record uh, callbacks is not that hard. Like, I mean, how, can you, how do you deal with the potential for you know, really any part of the code to call you know, some update call on, on your tape, right? or just turn off the, uh, the callbacks for a little bit because whatever the developer had some issue and they, they needed to do that. So you know, this is, of course, possible in other languages as well. Right? I mean, Java, C++, whatever the language you use, there is a way to bypass the protections that are provided by the language and the framework you use. But Ruby is special because it's I mean, what's so good about it is also, in this case, it's bad. <coughs> because it has weaker protections about scopes. And basically, any code can call any code. Almost. Almost. Um, and, uh, and that's great in most cases. But in this case, it actually makes it kind of hard to find and eliminate uh, unnecessary calls or unwanted calls to your code. So just to reiterate, um, you know, if, if you look at, at what you get if you have active record, right, you get a lot of stuff just by virtue of declaring a class as, as an active record base. And you know, a lot of that stuff is really, really useful in most of the time. But I mean, if you have that class, or if you think about that class in the context of the transaction, right, it's, it's possible, and you, I'm sure people can come up with you know, a few ways I've described too, uh, of bypassing our body trails if they were using active record. So a Airbnb part of our course is to use database triggers. We basically you know, don't care um, or don't worry about the changes at the uh, active record level, and you know, we let the database do the hard work. The problem is database triggers create other problems. Right? I mean, it's hard to manage a database that has triggers, it's hard to migrate it, it becomes you know, a, a, an operation I think. So we're experimenting with a few application level solutions where we're trying to see if we can, just for the payments related, uh, the payment tables, uh, have a little bit more stringent uh, access level and still allow the rest of the application to use uh, active record and, and all its benefits. <laughs> So I'll just give you a quick snippet here of you know one of the things we're experimenting with, basically creating this protected access um, gem that we're going to we're using, and it mimics Active Record in the sense that it looks and feels like a little bit like Active Record, but what it does internally is it hides the actual Active Record model inside the class in a private. Um, in a private member. And that means that anyone outside of this particular class cannot see, well, people have to work harder if they want to see the active record model. Um, so, you know, you, you, I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, you know, what's the big deal, right? If, if you don't use active record, you don't use active record, but then you don't have the benefits of active record. And I think what we're trying to achieve here is this middle ground where you can still expose active records uh, methods, or you can expose methods that make uh, mutations to uh, the underlying table, but you have to do it explicitly. You have to add another method to your protected access model. And that means 
you know, on the negative side, it's more work, right? You, you, don't, you don't just get it for free. But on the positive side, it has to be coded. So someone has to think about it and actually add it. And then after it's coded, it has to be code reviewed. So someone else needs to actually agree that this is a good idea. And you know, a discussion can be had about the pros and cons, and you know, there's no accidental uh, messing around with, with any of these tables. So you know, we sacrifice speed and, and ease of use, but we get in return uh, a much more explicit way of interacting with our database, and we can ensure through uh, protected access that everything is audited as well. So the next thing I wanted to talk about um, is early detection of errors. And you know, I'll explain why I have this tiny spare wheel here. Um, because I think, uh, or first, let's, before that, let, let me just make sure that um, you understand what I'm referring to when I'm saying errors. I don't mean the errors that happen when the user interacts with the system. So you know, if a user is typing the wrong credit card number, that's not the error I care about for the purposes of this uh, I mean, this is like a normal flow. It's an error, but you know, the application needs to deal with it as part of its normal um, processing. The errors I'm concerned with here are the kind that your application can continue with. So it's kind of like a flat tire, right? You're driving down the road, there's a flat tire, that's it. You can move, right? Um, so you, know, you have, um, you're expecting that um, you know, a form will contain a credit card field and it doesn't contain it. Or you're expecting that the database is going to be in a certain state and it's not in that state, right? There's nothing you can do. It's a bug. Someone messed up at some point, and someone needs to fix it. And this is another uh, thing where uh, we're taking a different approach than what might be the standard, um, or the, the, yeah, the, the standard uh, approach often done with Rails is we'd like to make sure that if there's a flat tire, we stop and we call the tow truck, uh, or we call sometimes uh, someone to, uh, can fix it. There's an excellent book, um, The Pragmatic Programmer. I don't know if anyone here knows it. Uh, it's kind of old. It's from, I think, 99. But it's still very, very relevant. And this is how they uh, talk about it. Right? Dead programs don't really. Um, and, and it's very true. So, you know, how, how does that work? At the edge of the system, every, you know, the start of processing, every still of the API. Or, um, well, okay, at the end of the system, when APIs come in, when calls from clients uh, come in, parameter validation is what we have. And that causes the programs to terminate early if there's an error. Uh, also, when there are uh, invariants in the code, places in the code where you would put a comment, this should never happen, right? So if you have a comment, this should never happen, replace it with a fail and you know, raise an exception. Because if it should never happen, but it actually has, you know, something is really, really wrong, and you don't want to. You don't want to keep limping along on this tiny spare tire because you know it's going to potentially damage your car. You might, um, you know, write something wrong to the database. You might mess some response to the user. It's better to throw off a hundred. You have a few users suffer maybe, but at least <coughs> someone will get hurt. Someone will know that there's a problem, and you can fix it. So, you know, parameter validation sounds good in theory, but you know, it can very, very quickly uh, deteriorate into something really, really messy. And I can almost see those you know, thought models, you know, it's like, yuck, this is like Java, you know, it's like terrible. Um, but, you know, we've created uh, a little BSL that makes it a little less ugly. Um, and, um, you know, it, you can define a method and use the DSL. There's a convention of, we use the convention of passing options as a named hash with all the parameters, and then you can easily assert <coughs> what's there and what's not there. Um, this also solves other problems. For example, if someone makes a typo and you know, uh, instead of confirmation code, they, they mistype confirmation code, this will complain about it too. So the DSL also validates that stuff that's not expected is not there. Um, and once you have this validate method, you can just write it, 
You put it somewhere, like at the end of your file, or at the beginning of the file, whatever. Put it somewhere and, and you don't have to look at it anymore. Right? So the main, the meat of your work it doesn't have to be uh, muddy with, uh, with validation. So, all right, we talked about uh, protecting your database from unintended changes, and, and keeping an audit trail, um, and parameter validation. But still, all too often, this is at least what I feel like when you know, I'm, I'm dealing with production issues. It's, it's, it happens you know, every, everywhere I go. You know, it's, it's always like this. And, and I think it's, it, it begs the question, you know, what's missing? You know, what else is, is going wrong? Um, and I think you know, one of the things that we try to think about a lot when we um, write the code and, and evaluate the code is uh, something called the law of the reader. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details of what each line in here means. I think the, the high level is that you should not reach out into things that are not directly accessible to you. So if you are in a particular class and you're trying to, um, you're trying to do something, let's take an example, right? If you're um, in a class that's, you're trying to apply a coupon, right? Notice that there's coupon.department try name, right? Uh, and by the way, this is uh, inspired by um, Avdi Grimm's uh, excellent uh, blog post about this. So you, know, you should look it up. It's, it's a good post. And I tried to simplify it a little bit here, and maybe the example is a little bit uh, contrived, but you know, bear with me. I'll, I'll try to uh, walk you through it. Um, so you know, the coupon.department is a direct access, right? So coupon, uh, you're just reaching into coupon and saying, okay, you're in the department. But now you're making an assumption, you're saying, oh, I'm not sure coupon has an apartment, but if it does, I'm going to go and reach into the name of it. Right? So you're, you're now, your code is now dependent on two hops away from, from this method, from this class. Right? And let's assume you're doing that in several places in, in this particular class, in this particular object. Right? Now, what if coupon were to change how it encodes the department? You actually don't care about the department, right? What you're trying to do is to access the department name, right? But now you're actually caring about the department because you're saying, give me the department. And then you're saying, okay, if the department exists, give me the name. So a slightly better way of doing this is to have the knowledge of how, given a coupon, is the, um, the department uh, provided. And uh, you, can, you can use it to, uh, to get that. So, um, I, I just realized now that I don't have the name here, and, you know, I should, I should fix that. But I think that the key concept here is as follows. It's that instead of dereferencing coupon into the department, you have a method that does that for you. And you segregate that knowledge into that method. And you don't have to worry about it at the rest of the, in the, rest of the code. Uh, an even better way would be to have the department um, be have this code maybe be part of coupon, right? And then you don't even have to worry about it here. But you know that's a separate issue. I'm just trying to focus on what you would do here. So, um, and I think it's important to not confuse it with just chaining. It it doesn't mean just because there's the law of the meter doesn't mean that chaining is bad. Right? The 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 way to differentiate is if you're chaining something that is the same type of object. For example, here. It's string, right? You're taking a string, returning a string, doing something to it, it's still a string, doing one more thing, it's still a string, right? So this is just convenience. You're just replacing you know, consecutive parameter um, assignments instead of having a local, uh, local variable and assigning to it again and again, you're just changing, right? That's, that's okay, you're not making any more assumptions about the string, you're not tightly coupling yourself to how string is. Um, I mean, long chains might be hard to read, but at least they don't violate the law of the year. So they don't contribute to, uh, to spaghetti clauses. Um, I, I want to talk about another thing, um, and, and that's testing. Uh, I'm not going to go into you know, testing frameworks, or you know, this framework is better or, or worse than, than another. Um, I just want to propose this, this idea to you that I think you know, a lot of people have very different opinions on and sometimes 
it, it gets into religious wars. So you know, I'll just focus on, on the payments use case. And, um, and you know, it's the idea is small is beautiful. And you know, when it comes to testing, um, really, really, really try to have your methods and your, um, your classes as small as you can. It's like again trying to find a, a hole in, in, in your bicycle. It's, you know, there's, you go step by step, you, you need to cover the whole thing, right? And each time you, you, you look at this one spot until you find the bubble that tells you that, you know, here is the, the, the air is leaking. And, you know, if, if you have large files, particularly large models, it's really, really hard to test them. And because it's really hard to test them, um, they're often not tested well. So the coverage uh, and the quality of the tests is insufficient. Which means that you're always thinking about this you know, leak. You're suspecting that there's a leak somewhere, that you know, you're losing air, but you're not sure until you know you realize that there's a fire. So you know, being unsure about your, your tests is, is really bad. Right? You want to know that your model is tested and is tested well. And that you know, if it's three thousand lines long, you know, how can you guarantee? Again, think about the auditor or the judge, right? For the radius, how can you guarantee that there's no off by one cent there in that entire file, in that in, in one scenario that's like an edge case? Right? You can't. So having smaller files, especially smaller models, uh, is a really important thing in, in this in this scenario. And I know that a lot of people, you know, object to having anemic models. You know, actually um, advocate having more functionality in models. That may be true in some cases. I'm not saying it's across the board a bad idea. What I am saying is that if you want to have a model that's really, really well tested, a good starting point is to have it do as little as possible and segregate or move uh, the heavy lifting somewhere else. And one thing we do uh, at Airbnb um, for moving the everything somewhere else is use what we call service objects. Service objects are used to communicate with servers inside our infrastructure, but also sometimes they're used inside um, an application to define APIs. And we want to have a clear definition of an API between two pieces of code. Excuse me. But I mean, a service object is, I mean, it's a fancy name. All it is is a perform method, which you see here at the bottom, wrapped with some standard logging and uh, exception handling. And um, it just, it's just, it can be called only once. And after it's called, it has to be thrown away. It returns its results in a hash that you can then inspect. But it's basically a glorified method call. But why is it, why is it good? Why, why do we like it? Well, first of all, we have this, um, this um, concept of doing the validation elsewhere. So I already talked about the validation uh, framework that we have. We usually put all the validation code in validate right? We call it uh, from the initialization code, and you know, we're done. We know now inside the perform method that the parameters are what we expect. Um, we also often um, avoid having any real functionality in the perform method. It only calls out to other small methods that are defined within the service object, and they're all private. So we are sure no one can call them. It's only the service object, and um, the perform method is very small, and it has a few calls to other methods. That's all. So it's really easy if you open up one of those files. A, the name is really descriptive because that thing does one thing. It's almost like a method. Name, right? The name of the file. So it's really, it's really easy, given a file, to know what it does. Also, if you want to look inside, you don't have to bother with the validation, the initialization. You don't care about those things, right? You can go straight to the perform and understand what the file is doing. So as we have more and more of those, um, it, it becomes clear that you know, those are much easier to test. They're smaller, typically, and um, they have uh, well-defined dependencies. So the initialization, you can see here, lists out all the dependencies of this service object. Um, and, and, and that also makes it easier to test. If you want to test it, you just need to provide these parameters and that's it. Um, and that way we can avoid 
uh, unnecessary use of, for example, factor girl uh, or, or database level access. We have dependencies here, we can mock them out, and that's it. Another thing we use, and this I think is, is outside of, of the specifics of payments, it's, it's good practice in general, um, is the ABC complexity um, filter. So ABC complexity is essentially assignment, branch, and condition. It, it does some math with them. Um, uh, it measures how many assignments, how many branches, how many conditions. It um, takes the square of them and then square roots the, the, the final reason. So it ends up being a number, and the bigger the number, the more complex um, your code. And the defaults, which are pretty good, are set at 15. So 15 is considered the cut. Below 15 is an OK, a uh, good method. Above 15 is too big. So let's just again look at a very, very simple example. Um, here's a piece of code, right? And it takes you a second to read through it and understand what it does, right? And um, here's another piece of code that does the same thing, except its ABC complexity is much less. It's almost half of the first example. So you know what happened here? Um, well, the ABC complexity. If, if we go back to the previous example, you know, there's you can see that there's a lot of dereferences here. Users dereferences, dereference for parameters, um, messages last sent by. There's a lot of dereferencing here, and there's an if and else. So an else is also counted against the um, compared to this example where we just extract the, uh, the even, which is what we care about, right? we do a quick check to see if we actually need to deal with it, and if not, we just reach it. And then, all that's left is to actually call send. Looking at this code, it's much easier to understand what it does, it's much easier to see the validation of the source. It's not really validation, it's um, you know, checking edge conditions uh, at the beginning, and then you're left with the actual work. So the ABC complexity doesn't tell you to do this, but if your method is too complex, by simplifying it, you will end up uh, moving towards this direction. And of course, it's up to each developer and the conventions of whatever organization you're in to, to decide how exactly to do that. And then one other thing I wanted to mention, and again, it's, it's a a general concept, I don't think it's specific to payments, but I think it's very, very important, is the don't repeat yourself. And again, this is this was introduced in the same book I referred to, uh, the programmatic programming. And those three words, single, unambiguous, unambiguous, and authoritative, uh, are really the key here. Um, so every piece of knowledge, be it in code or in data, I would argue, though this, this uh, rule doesn't say but I would argue that code and data uh, should have a single and unambiguous and authoritative um, representation within your system. Um, and I think, you know, a, a, a way I like to think about it is, you know, those, those labels that you find on the backs of computers and, you know, pretty much everywhere, right? Um, if you look at the UL uh, label um, on, the, on the left, bottom left, right, this label, um, is, is actually your way of going to the computer manufacturer and talking about the mechanical uh, properties of the computer, how it's constructed, and what's, what's the size, and thermal requirements. It also talks about the electrical stuff. It talks about the, the computer being able to protect itself to some degree from problems in the network, the, the electrical grid, and also not exposing the electrical grid to problems of its own, if it knows that there's a lot of stuff. If you read the specification, it's you know, lots and lots and lots of pictures. Right? Instead of going and saying that every time, repeating yourself every time, you go and you check, is there a UL uh, local? And if there is, you know that this authoritative a single unambiguous definition in the spec is actually implemented in this in this problem. So, um, of course, this is uh, this is a metaphor for a different problem, right? But if we go back to the example we had from, from earlier, um, you know, this is an example of drilling because there's one place where we actually extract the department from coupon, and we no longer care about it outside of this method. The knowledge is in here, and that's it. If we ever change it, we change this method, and the rest of the code doesn't need to care about it. So, you know, 
so a few parting thoughts. Uh, as I've um, indicated earlier, I don't think all of the stuff that, that I've presented here is, is relevant for, uh, for all of the kinds of applications you can go with. But it definitely is, in my opinion, important for payments because of the unique requirements of payments. And, and I'd like to also uh, finish with, with a meta point. Um, I think metaphors, and maybe you, you don't like my world, my, my uh, metaphorical world, you know, it's all about tires and flat tires and whatnot, but metaphors are in general really, really important when we think about software. Because the world actually has gone through the design of systems before there were computers. And people have thought through those things and have created <coughs> solutions that are very used, but very useful as metaphors. And we can use them. And if we find the right metaphor, we can sometimes make our lives a lot easier in how we design our code and uh, how, how we learn from other people's mistakes, even if they are in a different um, line of work, even if they don't write code, even if you know, their decision was made hundreds of years ago. Um, so um, with that, if there's um, any questions, you know, I have to take them. Yes. I noticed that the near the beginning when you insert a protected class for active method, active record inside of, inside of your class. Yep. Um, that you use the line called insert only. Yes. So you don't want so you're trying to keep a an atomic database inside your database. Are you using are you using just a regular database? Yeah, so or are you using a special atomic database? So that's a good that's a good catch. Uh, the insert only is another gem that we're using, which is very, very basic. It, it basically declares, uses active records, um, um, existing mechanisms to declare that the active record model is insert only. So once it, it, you can only mew it, and once you save it, that's it. You cannot make any changes to it. Um, and that's very useful when we're talking about audit trails, um, because even though a an object might be new. For example, if you have a transaction, right? A transaction might transition from pending to success or failure, right? Or the amount might change because of something, right? So the object itself might be mutable, but the role in the database is not. So every time um, you create a new or you, you mutate the object, in this case, the, the, the particular case that the snippet is taken from, we actually create a new role uh, in the database. So we're using MySQL um, at the moment. And we, we have no concrete plans to move away from it for payments. But what we are um, experimenting with is different ways of keeping um, the audit trail and uh, the, the uh, history of mutations. So um, the, the way I just described, where every time there's a mutation of the object you've been certain with row, is a little bit difficult. It has problems. So we're also experimenting with having an archive table, basically a side table. So if you have transactions, you have transactions archived. And mutations and transactions actually happen, but every time there's a mutation, a row gets written to the archive so that you have the history. And that makes it easy to use active records straight out of the box and you know do plain SQL uh, on that transaction. Just a quick follow-up, like what what is a lot of people probably are familiar with creating basic payments system. Like, what kinds of models would you use that kind of that kind of product trade model? Like your orders, um, or just your payment transactions? So that's a very good question. I mean, I think I think the high level um, I have a high level answer to this would be as little as possible. Right? So you don't want to. I mean, messing with audit trails and you know insert only and you know, all this history stuff. It's complicated and it's painful, and generally people hate it. Rightfully so, right? It's so convenient to, to use Rails, and you know, this just you know, makes it not convenient. So we try to use it as little as possible. But you know, so, so if you look at you know, some of the stuff that we're doing, um, transactions are uh, immutable and so only and you know, um, audited, but balances, for example, are not. Because balances can be computed from transactions, right? So, you know, there's no need to make them, you know, audited and all that stuff because it actually will create problems. If you have two things recording the same data, now we have a sync problem. It can get out of sync, and they will, right? They will. It always happens. 
So it's better to not choose the one that is the source of the data, in this case, transactions. And the balances are almost considered like a cache of that data. Yeah, you can cut if you wanted to. You can not have a balances table, and every time you can do a sum of all the transactions. Of course, that, that's not uh, performant, but you know, conceptually speaking, balances are, uh, you can calculate them from transactions. So, you, you know, the high level is as little as possible. Only the things that you must, that you, and I always think about the auditors. Right? Auditors come in, you know, what are they going to be looking at? What are the questions? That, are, that they're going to be asking. And if it involves you know, some of those tables, then you know, we, we lock them down. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, I've used some gems in the past, like the paper trail, mm -hmm. that have provided sort of this kind of functionality. Can you comment on uh, how those different from what you're talking about can call and what they may or may not provide? So, um, to be perfectly honest, we are currently evaluating some of those gems. We're, as I said, we're still experimenting with this. This is um, all stuff that we started doing a couple months ago. Um, I don't know enough to uh, answer this uh, in a more detailed way, but what I will say is that um, what we need is something that generates SQL um, and, and generates data structures that are accessible by SQL. Um, I think some of those gems, Audit Trail, there's another one, um, I forget its name, uh, use different um, mechanisms to keep history. I think um, they use some sort of uh, blob of data in it, um, which might be you know, a non starter for us because you know, there are downstream consumers of that data and they rely on the data um, internally to be uh, accessible via Z. Um, I'll just mention, since we're talking about uh, alternatives, uh, we are also um, actively uh, exploring using uh, non-SQL uh, mechanisms to propagate changes. Um, so instead of writing a row into a archive table and relying on that for downstream changes, we might use a system like Kafka, um, Apache Kafka, to propagate, basically, Kafka is a, a reliable, resilient, um, deliver, um, deliver at least once guarantee uh, system. Uh, so it's like a message key, but very robust in a city of uh, So instead of writing a row to a database, we might publish the row to Kafka and then have a consumer on the other end write the row to the, the consumer database. So we're experimenting with that as well. Yes? Do you have some kind of uh, way of tagging the uh, escalation process for Things that come in from customers that aren't handled well by your employee code, and how do you handle that? Yeah, uh, that's a that's a very good question, and I think you know it's a there's a generic system. Uh, it's not specific to to the payments uh, side of Airbnb, but in general we um, we have all the I don't know standard uh, mechanisms. Um, so you know. Um, Basically, if code throws an exception in production, um, you know, it gets collected and it's visible um, to us in the back end. Um, we have you know, all kinds of metrics in order. So I think as problem happen, um, we get alerted to, let's say, if there's a new kind of exception that's started to be thrown or you know, an exception that's been thrown um, consistently, you know, someone will go and take a look at it and have a visit. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question. If I can keep on going a little bit, I'm, I'm thinking specifically of something like a, uh, say that you and a customer disagree on the state of a payment, uh, which happens with some payment processors, not any games. <laughs> and so, you know, for whatever reason, that got passed, whatever error handling, and you can do your own and so on. Right. So, you know, how strict are you about dealing with that? What's your mechanism? Yeah, so, I mean, I think this. This is a little bit outside of you know, the area I normally um, operate in. Um, there is a customer service operation uh, here, that we, actually a pretty large one. Um, and within it, there's a small group that is focused on, um, on payments. So um, you know, those people typically 
end up dealing with customers that have um, questions or issues with uh, their payments. I think, generally speaking, um, the philosophy at Airbnb, and I'm not, this is not uh, necessarily payment specific, generally speaking, the philosophy at Airbnb is, you know, Airbnb wants to make the whole um, travel experience for users as pleasurable as possible. And um, we try very hard to um, assume that our users are um, well-meaning and that you know there's a real if they call then there's a real problem and can be on their side. It still that, that, that doesn't mean how that doesn't mean that we solve disputes in a certain way always, but there's a group of people that that's what we do. Other questions? Alright, thanks a lot.